Before we get started, we'd like to especially thank Thermo Fisher for sponsoring this session. Thermo Fisher Scientific is the world leader in serving science. Their mission is to enable their customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. Uh, good day to all. On behalf of the World Sepsis Congress, I would like to welcome all of you who are attending this session from various parts of the world. We've got an exciting set of talks which are lined up today, which are looking at the theme of biomarkers in the diagnosis and management of sepsis and COVID-19. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank our exclusive sponsor for this session, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Uh, and uh, I would also request all of you to please Type in your questions in the chat box because each of these questions will be taken up uh, as much as possible at the end of the session. Uh, today's first speaker is uh, Tom van der Paul. Tom is a professor of medicine and chair of the Department of Medicine in the Amsterdam University Medical Center. Tom's research focuses on pneumonia and sepsis, partic particularly on the pathogenesis, host response, immunotherapy, and biomarkers. Uh, today, Tom will be talk talking on the topic host response biomarkers in sepsis and COVID-19 with a particular focus on the differences. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Benilla. Um, good morning to all of you, or maybe good afternoon, or maybe good night. Uh, depends on where you are. Uh, my talk is uh, about sepsis and uh, COVID-19 and comparison of host response biomarkers in these two conditions. Let me first start by um, rehearsing the definition, the current definition of sepsis with you, the sepsis 3.0 definition, which is life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to an infection. And when we look about sepsis, it's important to realize, in particular in the context of this talk, where we will discuss COVID-19, that the, the lungs, so pneumonia, uh, is the most important, the most frequent source of infection in patients with sepsis. And also when you look at the type of organ failures and on the, ref, on the right hand side of the slide, you see the SOFA scores, the, the SOFA organ uh, scores, uh, that also the lung is the most frequent organ that is affected when it comes down to dysfunction in patients with sepsis. So the lung is an important organ in sepsis in general. Uh, recently, uh, the Greek uh, group, um, the Greek sepsis group, uh, studied the incidence of sepsis in COVID-19 patients, and they separated that out um, in patients that were admitted to the ICU and patients that were admitted to the ward. And then they looked in, uh, looked at how many of these COVID-19 patients fulfilled the sepsis 3.3 criteria. And then it looks like that on the ICU, almost 80% of COVID-19 patients fulfills the sepsis 3.3 criteria, whereas on the ward, approximately one third of all patients uh, fulfill the sepsis 3.0 criteria. So there seems to be a connection between the two and uh, many patients with COVID-19, in particular on intensive care, actually have sepsis uh, according to the current definition. Then looking at organ dysfunction, it shouldn't come as a surprise that patients with COVID-19 in particular have a pulmonary organ dysfunction, um, and many of those fulfill the ARDS criteria. So close to 90% of patients that are admitted to the ICU with COVID-19 have ARDS. So there's a, an overlap between COVID-19 and sepsis when it comes down to clinical definitions of these syndromes. Now, if you look at literature and, and also uh, in the non-scientific literature, and this is YouTube, uh, there's a lot of um, word out there about the so-called cytokine storm. So this is a buzzword. Um, and there, there's so many papers um, and, and movies that relate to the cytokine storm in COVID-19. Um, so the first question that I would like to ask, uh, talking about host response comparison between sepsis and COVID-19, uh, is there, in fact, a cytokine storm in COVID-19? Now, one of the next speakers, Peter Pickers, uh, uh, together with his colleague, Thijs Cox, uh, looked at this uh, in a YAMA paper now almost two years ago at the start of the pandemic, um, looking at uh, three pro-inflammatory cytokines um, from left to right, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-6 and interleukin-8, and in different syndromes in patients that were admitted to the ICU. Uh, 
um, you see in, in the lower panels COVID-19 with ARDS as compared to sepsis with ARDS, sepsis without ARDS, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and trauma. And clearly what you can see that sepsis with ARDS is associated with the highest cytokine levels. And even sepsis without ARDS, usually the median is higher than in COVID with ARDS. So this raises doubt um, whether there is indeed a cytokine storm in patients with COVID-19. And shortly thereafter, this, this nice uh, meta-analysis appeared in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, uh, led by Cliff Deutschman, where they looked at a large number of papers that were then published about cytokine levels in uh, COVID-19 in patients admitted to the ICU. And their main conclusion was that um, the findings overall question the role of a cytokine storm in COVID-19-induced organ dysfunction. So the take-home message of this first part is that there seems to be not as much of a cytokine storm as is much advocated in literature and including on, in, on YouTube. Now, there's also a lot of uh, <clears throat> um, literature out there about the procoagulant tendency of COVID-19. And clinically, this is clearly associated with an increased incidence of all kinds of thrombotic complications, which relates to both venous uh, thrombosis, like deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, but also arterial um, events uh, like stroke and myocardial infarction. And the question then is, is this related to more profound coagulation activation? Now, this is quite an interesting study where they looked at the main initiator of coagulation activation in patients with COVID-19, or the, the tissue, I'm talking about tissue factor. Tissue factor is the main initiator of coagulation activation in general, also in sepsis. And then they looked at microvesicle associated tissue factor activity uh, in patients with COVID-19. So microvesicles are small vesicles that are circulating and which can contain bioactive molecules such as tissue factor. And uh, these microvesicles, if they contain tissue factor, are highly procoagulant. So this is a study where they looked at um, the, the amount of circulating uh, tissue factor associated microvesicles. Um, and clearly in severe COVID, there's more of these microvesicles when compared to moderate COVID. But the more interesting part is on the right side, there they compared patients with thromboembolic events, TEE, with patients that did not have a thromboembolic event in COVID-19. And sure enough, those patients with a thromboembolic event have higher circulating levels of microvesicles containing tissue factor, indicating that there may be a link between procoagulant effects and these thromboembolic complications. However, if you then start to compare uh, the procoagulant parameters in patients with sepsis versus COVID-19, it emerges that um, COVID-19 is not very unique when it comes down to coagulation activation. So this is D-dimer levels in patients with sepsis versus COVID-19. And patients with sepsis actually, actually have higher D-dimer levels. And this was confirmed in multiple other studies. So this is only one example of this. On the left-hand side, you see again D-dimer levels and confirming that patients with sepsis have higher levels of D-dimer than patients with COVID-19. And the microvesicle tissue factor activity is sort of similar between the two conditions. So there, there's a huge overlap and, and there's not a strong differences between COVID-19 and sepsis. So also in the procoagulant response, it, it seems like COVID-19 is definitely not unique when it comes down to sepsis, and sepsis seems to be associated maybe even with more of these disturbances. So in our own group, we compared non-critically ill patients, so not on the ICU, and we compared a sort of conventional community-acquired pneumonia versus uh, COVID-19. So these were all hospitalized patients, but on a general ward, not on the ICU. And this work was done by Alex Schuurman and Tom Reinders, and they compared a large number of um, host response biomarkers, up to 80, between those two conditions. And this is a volcano plot showing that there's quite some differences between COVID-19 and community-acquired pneumonia, um, where you see on the, on the top right-hand side, there, there's quite a few markers that relate to antiviral response that are higher in COVID-19. There's also a large overlap between the two conditions. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side of the slide. So there's also a common response between uh, uh, conventional CAP and COVID-19. Then when you zoom in a little bit about differences between CAP uh, caused by streptococcus pneumoniae, the most common causative pathogen in uh, community-acquired pneumonia versus 
COVID-19, there's quite a few differences. And also between influenza and COVID-19 in the middle panel, there's also quite a few differences. So there seems to be differences in the host response uh, between COVID-19 and conventional CAP in patients that are not critically ill, so that are admitted to a regular hospital. Then uh, Tom and Alex stratified all of these biomarkers into pathophysiological domains. And the endothelial um, vascular endothelial lining has received a lot of attention in COVID-19. Um, so we looked at all of these different markers and we stratified those patients between CAP caused by uh, streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, influenza COVID-19 and all other CAPs. And the, the take home message of this slide is that although um, the endothelial barrier function received a lot of attention in COVID-19, actually the endothelial barrier function, function is less disturbed in COVID-19 when compared to other CAPs. And this is shown on the right-hand side of the slide, the angiopoietin 2, angiopoietin 1 ratio. Um, the dotted line is the normal value. So you can see that COVID-19 is not so disturbed, especially when you compare it to the other community-acquired pneumonias. Other parameters are more disturbed, like VCAM1, which is an endothelial cell activation marker on the left-hand side of the slide, and also Syndigan on the far right-hand side of the slide, which is a marker of glycocalyx function, which is the anticoagulant surface of the vascular lining, is also more disturbed in patients with COVID-19. So basically, it's a mixed bag, and it's not that COVID-19 is associated uniformly with more disturbed endothelial cell function. The coagulation response is depicted on this slide, um, and there you can see it, it's not so different between these different um, um, diagnoses groups. Um, COVID-19 does not discriminate itself very much from the other forms of community-acquired pneumonia, except maybe for the fibrinolysis inhibitor, which is PI1 on the far right-hand side. So coming to the conclusion of my talk, what I've uh, told you is that most COVID-19 patients that are admitted to the ICU actually fulfill the sepsis 3.0 criteria. So clinically, these are overlapping syndromes. But then when you look at the host response biomarkers, um, it's definitely that there's a humongous overlap between COVID-19 and sepsis patients. But that it's definitely not true that COVID-19 is associated with a cytokine storm or with a huge procoagulant response when compared to sepsis patients. And in the final part of my talk, I alluded to hospitalized patients on a general ward and that there's uh, quite some distinctive host response biomarkers there between COVID and conventional community acquired pneumonia, but there's also humongous overlap. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for your crisp session and uh, sticking to time. We just, I'll just take quickly, go through the questions. Uh, it's more like a statement that is written out here. And uh, if you would like to comment on it, uh, Tom. Uh, it's about uh, there being no published evidence at all uh, of high of such high percentage of intubated COVID, that such high percentage of intubated COVID nineteen patients truly had ARDS. They had hy acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Even in the recovery trial, the authors were unable to classify mechanically ventilated COVID nineteen patients as having ARDS and non ARDS. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, the question was with regards to thrombosis. What, what I can say is I'm, I'm not an ARDS expert, but the diagnosis of ARDS is pretty difficult. And uh, we use the Berlin definition for this nowadays, which was generated a few years ago. Uh, but I've also attended a lot of lectures where the ARDS specialists themselves um, raised doubt about whether the syndrome of ARDS would still exist, let's say, 20 years from now because it's a mixed bag of, of, um, of abnormalities, and in particular in patients with COVID-19 that have abnormalities by definition on their chest X-ray or CT scannings, uh, I think the additional diagnosis of ARDS may be more difficult um, uh, to make. Uh, I think there, there's other people in this meeting, like Peter Pickers, who was an intensive care physician, who may uh, answer this question um, in, in a more sophisticated way, and he will be speaking later during the session. Uh, Tom, there's another question on whether the results, uh, I'm not sure whether it's the, the results which you portrayed on the differences between um, the COVID pneumonia and the cap in the non-critically ill. It was talking about whether these results also factored in vaccinations for COVID-19. Did you compare vaccinated versus non-vaccinated um, 
as well as the different types of vaccines and development of thrombotic events? Uh, I did not. So the, all of these COVID-19 patients were enrolled prior to the availability of vaccines. Um, so I, I cannot um, uh, say anything about this. And this is definitely an interesting question. So we, we have the feeling that the spectrum of COVID has been changing, and particularly clinically. And this is basically due to raising, uh, uh, increasing immunity in the population based on vaccination status, but also on previous infections. And I think it's an extremely relevant question to, to look at COVID as a disease that is in movement uh, and not as static as many other diseases, because um, the spectrum has changed tremendously over the past two years. Uh, definitely, Tom, I agree with you. It's It's been very different. Each wave has been uh, different one, one from the other. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot more insight into these different topics once the uh, other speakers also get, uh, uh, get going. Thank you so much for a wonderful session, uh, Tom. And we'll try and address the other questions which are coming in. Uh, but in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next session by uh, Brendan Spikruna. Uh, Brendan is an assistant professor uh, department in the Department of Applied uh, Biomedical Science in the University of Malta. He's a senior lecturer in molecular biology, genetics, genomics, and research methods. I think over the years, there's been an increasing interest in uh, analyzing blood RNA uh, in hospitalized patients with sepsis, and more recently with SARS-CoV-2, with the purpose of getting some insight into the heterogeneity of responses seen in different patients. Uh, so given Brendan's background, we look forward to his talk on blood uh, transcriptomics in sepsis and COVID-19. What have we learned? Over to you, Brendan. Uh, thank you, Benila, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me, and uh, I'll be sharing with you uh, exactly what, uh, a little bit of what we've learned uh, so far with respect to blood transcriptomics uh, applied to sepsis, and also in a small part to uh, COVID-19. So nicely uh, enough, uh, Tom has already been through the definitions of sepsis, so I'll just jump to the chase here. And the uh, since its infancy, uh, the implications of blood transcriptomics in, uh, uh, with respect to sepsis pathophysiology, diagnosis and prognosis was, was very evident. Uh, the panel to the left showing uh, one of the very first, uh, almost 20 years ago now, uh, uh, arrays uh, that was composed of 350 gene probes. Uh, looking at uh, uh, severe sepsis relative to uh, uh, surgery, post-surgery control panel. Uh, uh, Dr. Tang uh, and colleagues uh, looked at uh, uh, a larger uh, cohort of critically ill patients with sepsis and also non-septic patients and also increasing the uh, uh, volume of uh, transcripts or genes that were probed, showing that there were uh, very distinct uh, clusters and also uh, quite uh, interesting, for example, the mitochondrial dysfunction and uh, the slew of uh, innate immune uh, pathways. Panel to the right, uh, uh, Dr. Payen showing also that there was a signal consistent with uh, mortality uh, in uh, blood transcriptomes captured from uh, 17 septic shock patients. And uh, from here, it was quite evident that the uh, heterogeneity in uh, the blood transcriptomes was uh, quite pronounced. And this uh, called for a better dissection of the sources of inter individual variation in uh, sepsis, be it uh, from the standpoint of the uh, clini clinical perspective, but also uh, from the molecular perspective. And as we know, Sepsis is caused by uh, uh, quite uh, a variable number of uh, pathogens, including also uh, at different sites of infection. And as Tom mentioned earlier, the respiratory system is one of the most important in this case. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, I am here uh, regarding it as uh, viral sepsis in the context of critical care, as mentioned by Dr. Vansant and also uh, Eleni Karakike and Evangelos in their lovely uh, reviews. So moving on to the sites of infection, they do represent a source of variation about transcriptomes. Uh, 
to the left, uh, Cathy Burnham from Julian Knight's group showed that there was, while there is quite a similar uh, response with uh, a number of genes in the middle of this venular plot that were common to both community acquired pneumonia patients and fecal peritonitis patients, there were, however, those unique uh, signatures, and this was all uh, relative to uh, health. So health here is a baseline. So, and there are these unique signatures that could indicate that there is a uh, uh, signal that is consistent with the primary site of infection. In a more comprehensive analysis from Tom's group, Hessel Sengers and uh, Joe Butler looked at the transcriptomes of a number of sepsic patients presenting respiratory uh, uh, infections, abdominal infections, urosepsis, cardiovascular, and also uh, central infections in certain nervous system. What we saw is, again, there was quite a predominant uh, common sickness response with respect to these transcriptomes. However, there were also these unique uh, signatures that were uh, uh, immediately detected using these approaches. As we move on, uh, we see that uh, the variation in the blood transcriptome is also dependent on the type of causal pathogen. To the left, far left, together with Tonneke van Furcht uh, in Tom's group, I've looked at uh, community acquired pneumonia patients relative to hospital acquired uh, pneumonia patients. And uh, these types of patients present different types of uh, infectious etiologies. And while there is quite, again, a, a similar uh, transcriptomic response, there are signatures there that provide uniqueness to these uh, uh, sites, to these uh, infectious pathogens. And in particular, we saw that there was an, a uh, pronounced interferon signaling signature that differentiated CAP patients from uh, HAP patients. Indeed, in CAP patients, um, viral infections were most often found in uh, hospital-acquired pneumonia. In the middle panel, uh, Lisa and uh, Pereverzeva, also in Tom's group, looked at specifically community-acquired pneumonia patients. Only this time, splitting patients based on their gram-positive or gram-negative etiologies. Again, a shared response, humongous shared response. However, there are signatures there dependent on uh, the causal pathogens. And to the far right, uh, together with uh, uh, Mihai Natea's group, we looked at bacteremia caused by either E. coli, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, bacteremia caused by E. coli and uh, candidemia. Again, we see a common uh, patient response in the middle portion of this venular plot. Uh, however, there are unique signatures here. So all in all, this tells us that while the blood transcriptomes across patients from different etiologies and presenting different uh, uh, infectious sites, there is variation there that can be captured uh, using these blood transcriptomes. This was also the case for COVID-19. And here, uh, uh, Simone Thier, together with uh, Tim Sweeney and uh, Evangelos, uh, saw that when you compare COVID patients to non-COVID patients, again, using health as a baseline, there is quite a correlation in the transcriptomic response, each dot here representing one particular gene. However, there were also uh, unique signatures that could be derived from non-COVID-19 uh, viral infections uh, relative to COVID-19 patients. In particular, if you look to the top panel to the right, we see that there was a common neutrophil-related uh, type 1 interferon response. And to the bottom, we see that there was a unique signature related to ribosomal RNA metabolism or ribosome uh, biogenesis that differentiated COVID-19 from uh, non-COVID uh, viral infections. Uh, beyond that, the uh, Multiomics Blood Atlas that was recently published by uh, Julian Knight's team or the Combat uh, Consortium showed that uh, the transcriptomic signatures, uh, bulk transcriptomic signatures uh, obtained, captured from uh, the blood, can differentiate between COVID-19 severity indices, 
and as well as all cause sepsis. The panel to the left shows principal component analyses looking at different uh, groupings of COVID patients going from mild to severe to critical and also from community, including uh, sepsis patients. And there's a, a very interesting trajectory here with respect to these transcriptomes as a function of uh, uh, severity. Looking directly at hospitalized COVID-19 patients, a lot of the differences that were observed were primarily related to uh, death in, uh, uh, due to COVID. Comparing these severely uh, sick COVID patients to those of uh, uh, obtained from sepsis patient show that there was quite a uh, pronounced difference in their transcriptomes, particularly the immunoglobulin chains here, indicating that uh, humoral immunity is uh, differentiating COVID-19 from uh, all-cause sepsis. Now this data, all the data I've spoke about thus far was related to bulk transcriptomics and uh, what we've also seen uh, through the, the past, the very recent years, is that at the single cell level, the transcriptomes can also provide uh, information as to the divergent cell states uh, captured using SCRNA-seq and their dependency on the severity in sepsis and also uh, COVID-19. So the left panel, this was a study in septic patients looking at uh, uh, healthy controls, um, urinary tract infection patients, so these are non-septic, urosepsis patients with transient uh, organ dysfunction, uh, sustained organ dysfunction in urosepsis patients, include, and also bacteria, bacteremic septic, septic patients, ICU uh, septic patients, and non-septic patients. What this analysis showed was that there, was one, there were quite a few cell states that were identified. However, one that uh, uh, struck the uh, uh, researchers and also us readers was the uh, expansion of a monocyte cell state where the authors detected four states uh, highlighting an MS1 uh, monocyte cell state. And the MS1 monocyte cell state seems to be increased in its abundance uh, related as a fraction of CD45 positive cells, uh, specifically in septic patients, perhaps also showing uh, a degree of dependency with respect to uh, disease severity. To the right, this is COVID-19 at the signal cell level, specifically looking at the B cell response here. And uh, what the authors noted was the expansion of plasma blasts as a function of severity in COVID-19. And this tells us that indeed, uh, not only at the bulk transcriptomic level, we can also see that at the single cell level, cell states are also relating to uh, primarily to a disease severity or clinical severity indices. These supervised analyses indeed have unlocked various uh, components of the heterogeneity in, uh, in sepsis, although these were all performed using supervised approaches. The uh, advent of unsupervised clustering and pretty much uh, uh, spearheaded in, in sepsis by the late Hector Wong, uh, the showed that in particular in this study, this very first study, pediatric sepsis patients can be clustered into three subclasses that primarily relate to uh, clinical severity indices. So these subclasses were defined using bulk transcriptomic data. And when you were relating these, transcript, these subclasses to uh, clinical indices, the immediate association with, in this case, PRISM score, and also uh, death or outcome was very evident. Uh, Julian Knight's group together with Emma Davenport and uh, Tom van der Poel's group, uh, we've shown that altogether there are uh, unsupervised clustering of blood transcriptomic data 
only this time looking at adult sepsis patients. Panel to the left, specifically commute acquired pneumonia patients. And to the right, this is all cause sepsis. Community acquired pneumonia patients can be stratified into two uh, sepsis response signatures, SRS1, SRS2, with SRS1 associating with uh, mortality in this case. So uh, a higher risk of mortality in patients who are classified as SRS1 relative to SRS2. And again, in both discovery and validation cohorts, there is an association between both uh, SRS signatures, or SRS groups rather, with SOFA scores and somewhat was only in the validation group to Apache 2 scores. So again, there's this relation to uh, clinical severity. Likewise, in the MARS cohort, we've shown that only this time, sepsis patients can be classified as four endotypes. And these endotypes can be identified using a classifier composed of 140 genes. By classifying patients in this way, we saw that uh, for a starter, there is a significant association with uh, SOFA scores, as previously described. Notably, the MARS-1 endotype and the MARS-2 endotype showing higher, relatively higher uh, SOFA scores. But of interest and uh, also adding uh, to uh, uh, the potential for a clinical application is the association with uh, mortality, where Mars-1 Mars classified patients were at the highest uh, risk of mortality. Here, this is only 28 day mortality, but this runs all the way up to uh, uh, one year. So we followed these patients up to uh, one year, showing the same uh, association, even stronger through time. Lastly, I want to make a note of, of the fact that uh, a bulk of the transcriptomic data that we've been gathering has solely focused on protein coding RNA. So these are RNA molecules that are earmarked uh, to uh, be translated into proteins. However, as the uh, RNA sequencing techniques have developed uh, and uh, advanced tremendously, we could see that there is that transcription in the genome is more pervasive than we once thought. And in fact, the so-called uh, junk DNA that was previously taught to students is not being uh, mentioned anymore nowadays because there are non-coding RNA molecules that are being produced. And uh, indeed, also in sepsis patients, this was a recent study uh, by uh, Tom's group, where I've looked at not only protein coding RNA to the left, these are volcano plots. Again, each dot represents a gene. In this case, the left panel is a protein coding gene, but also long non coding RNA and small non coding RNA. The long non coding RNA can be categorized based on the, the biotypes, where the predominant biotypes were long intervening non-coding RNA, antisense RNA, and also those pseudogenes. Whereas with regards to the small non-coding RNA, see more of the microRNA and also other forms of uh, small RNA, including stem loop RNA. So all in all, this tells us that there is a lot more information that we can gather now uh, by also including non-coding RNA in our uh, platforms. Concluding remarks, there are certainly differences in primary sites of infection and causal pathogens that uh, largely relate to a shared common uh, transcriptional response. However, there are distinct signatures that can be derived. At the single cell level, there are certainly common, but also partly divergent cell states that uh, uh, are associated with uh, clinical severity indices, at least uh, uh, in the main part. Unsupervised clustering of these of bulk blood transcriptomes can certainly identify patient subgroups or endotypes uh, with clinical implications, and also uh, uh, they may also guide uh, uh, therapy in future. Non-coding RNA are certainly robustly altered in sepsis patients and can 
provide uh, quite an important layer to uh, the regulome where uh, uh, the functional implications are uh, uh, quite impressive. Lastly, I want to uh, just mention that uh, the bulk of our omics studies in sepsis uh, has been done primarily in, uh, in high resource settings. And to better understand the uh, immune response, the host response in sepsis, and in particular to efficiently dissect the heterogeneity in uh, sepsis using these omics technologies, we really need to start considering uh, increasing or expanding our uh, granularity in the data by embracing studies also in low and uh, middle resource settings. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Brendan, for that wonderful talk. Um, I'll just take you through some of the, there are a lot of questions which have come up uh, and comments on how uh, the the talk was great. Uh, there's, um, I would like to ask you one question. One of this, a couple of questions were all focused around the same topic and uh, into like whether there's any evidence of the role of whole blood transcriptomics in guiding precision treatment. So is it just to correlate with you know, clinical severity or is there any evidence of uh, benefit in terms of precision treatment um, in guiding treatment for sepsis or for COVID? Uh, what is your take on that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and of course, given time constraints, I couldn't talk about everything. However, this is a very important point raised and uh, a seminal study in this respect was published also by uh, Julian Knight's group uh, together with uh, uh, David Antcliffe. And uh, data there showed that by classifying patients into SRS1 and SRS2 uh, groups, uh, the SRS2 classified patients did not benefit from uh, uh, hydrocortisone treatment. Now, this was uh, counterintuitive. Why? Because SRS2 group is the lower risk uh, signature. Uh, however, Given a certain level of hydrocortisone, the SR patients within the SRS2 group turned high risk. So we could be uh, detecting various signals uh, with respect or, let's say, uh, uh, bad signals coming from uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, while uh, measuring, monitoring these patients using uh, blood transcriptomic data. And I wouldn't say using the whole uh, spectrum of uh, genes that are expressed or non-coding RNA, but uh, preferably a uh, what we call a gene set that is derived for the purpose. And this ties in with the up and coming field of uh, theranostics. Yes, indeed. Uh, Brendan, just one last question before we move on. There are quite a few questions. So um, there's a question on how early or late could these findings be found? Is it found right from the start of disease or is it later in the disease? Um, when do you actually do the transcriptomics? With regard to the uh, unsupervised endotyping studies, these were generated on uh, uh, using blood obtained on ICU admission. Now, I would say it always depends on the question that, needs, that, that uh, uh, you want answered. So our question was, can we identify patient subgroups that uh, uh, could hold uh, prognostic value? So the best timing for that would be right on ICU admission. Of course, with respect to theranostics and monitoring treatment efficiency, it will be uh, uh, imperative to gather blood uh, from uh, other time points throughout a patient's length of stay uh, using these now uh, um, what we call repeated omics uh, uh, um, methods. Okay. Thank you so much, Brendan, for your talk. Uh, okay. We will try. And, yeah, we will try and cover questions towards the end if they are left out. So we'll move on to the next session uh, by Marie Scully. Marie is a consultant hematologist at the University College London Hospitals and she deals with hemostasis and thrombosis with a particular interest in platelet disorders, in particular thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and thrombotic microangiopathies. I think um, Tom has already mentioned a little bit about the procoagulant states in sepsis and COVID-19, and uh, there is a lot of 
debate on uh, the dysregulation of the coagulation pathway and endothelial function in COVID-19. So let's hear more about this topic from Ari, who will be taking us through uh, the procoagulant states of sepsis and COVID-19. Over to you, Marie. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm going to deal a, a little bit more on procoagulant states and comparing that of sepsis, ITU sepsis versus COVID-19 and see if they're comparable or in fact divergent. So sepsis is made up of a, a number of different components. So we have possibly a, a thrombotic type of um, coagulopathy associated with sepsis. We have disseminated intravascular coagulation, which we all know about, but even still we can miss. Um, and that's because often patients don't come in with all of these parameters. And it's a very, you know, it's a screening test, the coagulation screen that we use in routine laboratory practice, remembering that the majority of patients present initially with a low platelet count. And the impact of DIC is microangiopathic thrombosis. And then we have this well, let's say relatively newer term, it's not a new term, but one that we use more and more in um, COVID times, and that's consumptive coagulopathy. I don't think it really tells us the underlying pathology, but uh, it's used because it's not a DIC type situation in COVID and more thrombosis. So this is a summary of typical coagulation abnormalities as we have known pre-COVID with regards to sepsis. And although it looks very busy, the main take home messages of this is that sepsis is a graduation between a thrombotic phenotype when we're using up all the um, coagulation factors which normally protect us from thrombosis, so they become consumed. And then it, it, it tends into a bleeding phenotype. And that's when we start seeing reductions in coagulation factors. And that's important because at the beginning of uh, a DIC sepsis coagulation abnormalities, what we should be considering is anticoagulation. But there is a time and that time is very difficult to pinpoint where it goes from anticoagulation to replenishing coagulation factors. So this is a summary that we have both in COVID-19 and sepsis of the coagulation factors. So on the left-hand side, the table demonstrates the um, uh, anticoagulant and coagulation factor levels that we see in severe COVID-19 patients. And we did this within our own trust because it was important to understand initially the underlying defect. And the summary is the coagulation factors and anticoagulant levels are normal. Now, that's in the lion's share of patients. And clearly, with worsening disease in a small percentage, we can see a DIC type picture. In contrast, at the bottom of the table, we see VWF levels, factor eight levels, and D dimers, which are far more excessive than we would normally expect. Although in fairness, in the vast majority of patients with a DIC, we do not measure VWF levels because we often already have what the abnormality is. Part, part of that reflects patient sickness, but also part of it is telling us a bit about the underlying pathophysiology in COVID-19. And the diagram on the right really confirms what, what we've already discussed, and that is that we see a reduction in procoagulants and then a reduction in the factor, coagulation factor levels and platelet counts in what let's call it typical uh, sepsis DIC. So the underlying pathophysiology is really very different. So in sepsis, we have this more DIC type phenomena. In COVID-19, we have more of a thrombotic, thrombotic type coagulopathy. 
And this is a really nice paper uh, published in 2020, which actually compared COVID-19 odds versus non-COVID-19 odds. And so the D-dimer levels, although we have suggested they're really high in COVID, actually they're typically very high in septic patients. It doesn't mean we always check them. A fibrinogen, an inflammatory marker, will be higher in COVID-19. Coagulation um, uh, uh, screening tests at APTT is generally lower, but that's usually a reflection of a very high factor eight. Prothrombin time is typically increased, but rather it being, let's say, a deficiency of vitamin K dependent factors, it's more related to a common pathway associated abnormality. Platelet counts aren't particularly abnormal, as is uh, antithrombin, not particularly abnormal in COVID, but often reduced in, let's call it again, standard sepsis. What we also know from COVID is the massive increase comparable to what we normally see in thrombosis, that's typically pulmonary emboli, but often atypical thromboses are increased. And the incidence has been very, very varied and depends on a number of factors. So it's about 20 to 30% in non-COVID septic ITU patients, um, but in the incidence is significantly reduced in those countries or those regions that use thromboprophylaxis. But even given that, we don't normally see uh, a reduction associated with COVID-19. We saw an increase, so it required manipulation of anticoagulation um, uh, uh, therapeutics. The two, therefore, me uh, potential mechanisms for COVID-associated thrombosis appears to be related to BWF and fats rate and also the fibrinolytic pathway. And um, on the right-hand side, we can see the D-dimer level. So normally these are very low in uh, non-ICU patients that may be increased uh, they go up a bit in ICU patients, but it's particularly sepsis where, again, we see the highest D-dimer levels. So they're probably not the best predictor, even though they've been used extensively throughout COVID-19. What do we know about BWF and ADAMPS-13 in sepsis? In fact, the information we have on this uh, is really quite old now. So the mouse models have demonstrated the uh, impact of thrombosis in those mice who are ADAMPS-13 neg-neg for whom we give VWF. You can see the time to thrombosis is lower than those mice who were ADAMPS-13 pos pos but had no VWF. So just demonstrating the importance of ADAMPS-13 as well as von Willebrand factor. And in fact, we use both together and use a ratio to help us understand the differences in VWF depending on blood group. Um, around the same time, again, over well, a number of years ago, uh, my Swiss colleagues had a look at control patients and septic patients and we're able to demonstrate the reduction in ADAMPS-13, the significantly increased uh, von Willebrand, both activity and antigen levels. And if we look at these ratios, they will be significantly higher to even COVID-19. So they are, probably are a good marker of what's going on um, at a pathophysiological level. <clears throat> this is a lovely picture that um, uh, was uh, drawn just about a year ago, and it tells us a little bit more about the fibrinolytic pathway. And in fact, what the group uh, looked at was BAL samples from patients with ARDS, COVID ARDS, and found that the fibrinogen levels and the PI1 levels were increased, suggesting an increase in the fibrinolytic uh, activity higher than we would normally expect. And again, this is not a level that we would normally analyze in routine practice, certainly in the UK.
And histologically, we're seeing differences between sepsis versus COVID-19. So in septic patients, the damage to the uh, vasculature includes the wall thickening, uh, there's microthrombo formation um, as part of ARDS, whereas in COVID, in fact, I've got those the wrong way around, that the first one is in fact COVID-19, the second one is sepsis, but the sepsis one, there's often alveolar and interstitial edema and often a lot of neutrophil infiltration. And what I haven't discussed today, which is obviously another type of involvement from a coagulation pathway is netosis. What we mustn't forget are cytokines, and there's been an awful lot of discussion about cytokines during COVID-19, um, of which we have the pro-inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory cytokines, and they're absolutely required to protect us from irritation, injury and infection. And indeed, raised cytokines is completely normal. It's a normal pathophysiological response. The problem is, is when those levels become excessive to cause tissue damage. And these are cytokine levels that have been demonstrated uh, in the past in patients with sepsis. So we can see, unsurprisingly, that all the cytokine levels are increased in sepsis, but they increase and decrease depending on their pro or anti-inflammatory role. Conversely, in COVID-19, and this is some work from our group, um, and there was a lot of patients at different stages of COVID-19, you can see that the uh, uh, cytokines increased and worsened depending on how unwell a patient was. Not perhaps TNF-alpha, uh, IL-10, IL-6, and obviously CRP. And as obviously a consequence of that, we had tocilizumab, which primarily blocks IL-6. Is that the right uh, uh, cytokine that we should be targeting? Are these levels more than we would normally expect in other severely sick patients? I don't think that's a debate necessarily at this time, as there has been benefits shown on the platform studies. So the reason I put in the cytokines is it, it, it is integrally involved with the coagulation system and it's not just one or the other and both, both of them um, uh, deteriorate associated with thrombosis in COVID and thrombi versus bleeding in DIC depending on the stage of sepsis. So still a very complicated area, but I think we've got a better handle now compared to where we were two years ago. I'll finish there and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Marie. Thanks so much for that wonderful session. And um, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I think this question could be to both you and uh, to Tom. Uh, there was a question to Tom in the earlier session where uh, Tom had pointed out, and even in your session, you had pointed out that the biomarkers were not really significantly different. Uh, but in your session, you'd said that the von Willebrand factor and the fibrinolytic pathway, there seemed to be some differences in, in COVID-19 as compared to uh, the other diseases. But clinically, uh, I must admit, just like how the studies have shown here in India as well, we found a lot of thromboembolic phenomena, much more than what we would see uh, in the normal sepsis or a normal ARDS patient. Um, so um, are we looking at the right markers? Uh, is there something else which we should be looking at, if, like maybe platelets or something like that? This is something which we've been looking at here at Bellor, and what, what would you like to see on that? I mean, the platelets are relatively, uh, you know, normal throughout all of this. So there's no su suggestion that there's hyperaggregation and excessive release of their components. I mean, it will be increased because it's a hyperinflammatory state. But the VWF uh, ADAMP side of things, I think, are very important. I think that's come out time and time again. It's been able to predict severity, disease severity, um, uh, as opposed to, you know, trying to assume that there's a problem with 
and pro-coagulant, anticoagulant states, which is not really a feature. That has been proven. We should just move away from that situation and hit what is the problem. Of course, trying to deal with the fibrinolytic pathway itself is often very, very difficult. And TPA has been tried, both nebulized, um, but also uh, systemically it doesn't work. In fact, it can cause a lot of problems, more than you would expect for such a thrombotic state. So from a hematological perspective, I think the platelets are fine. I think we need to concentrate on therapies that reduce the VWF impact. But Tom may have another <laughs> view on that and indeed yourself. Thanks, Marie. Thanks for that response. I think we can go on and on debating on this uh, aspect and <laughs> we'll probably not reach a conclusion. But yes, definitely there is an increase in the pro in the prothrombotic manifestations and the thrombotic complications that we've seen with COVID. And hopefully we'll get, you know, more, uh, you know, over time we'll understand it uh, better. But thank you so much for your session. It was uh, uh, really wonderfully presented. We'll move on uh, to the next session by Peter Pickers from Radboud University in Netherlands. Uh, Peter is an inter internist intensivist and professor of experimental intensive care medicine. Uh, his research focuses on modulation of the innate immune response in translational models and patients, sepsis and specific organ dysfunction among which the kidney is uh, his primary interest. Um, I think uh, both sepsis and COVID-19 have actually been shown to have endothelial injury, uh, as Tom pointed out in his first session. And uh, there are session, there are some suggestions that endothelium should be evaluated as a therapeutic target uh, for disease. So over to Peter, who will be telling us more about the topic uh, biomarkers of endothelial activation and function in sepsis and COVID-19. Thank you very much, uh, Benilla, and uh, welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to you, wherever you are. Uh, and indeed, uh, this talk is about biomarkers of endothelial activation and to see if this can be used as a guide or not for targeted therapy. Uh, so to go back quickly to the background of the endothelium, it's clear that the endothelium is a huge organ uh, and it's uh, existing of a monolayer of cells that is representing the interface between the circulation and all parenchymal cells of all organs. And it has a central role in the regulation of vascular homeostasis, both vascular tone uh, as well as uh, vascular permeability. Uh, and in addition to that, it also regulates hemostasis and is relevant for local and systemic inflammatory responses. So to give you a few examples, this is not complete, but just to give you a few examples. For vascular tone, uh, both vasodilatory as well as vasoconstrictive mechanisms are regulated by endothelial cells, and both can be dysregulated during sepsis. For example, nitric oxide is a vasodilatory compound that is produced in large quantities during sepsis. For permeability, Thai 2 expression is really relevant and angiopoietins and VGF are really large players in regulating permeability of vessels. Uh, and again, this can be dysregulated during sepsis as well. And a part of these well-known regulators, also compounds like adrenomedulin and vasopressin are influencing permeability of cells and also relevant during sepsis. For inflammation, we have local paracrine responses and effects, but also systemic effects that are dysregulated during sepsis. And for coagulation, as we just heard by the previous speaker, there are anti and also pro-coagulatory effects, and both again are dysregulated during sepsis. Now, what further complicates these things is that there is a huge overlap in effects. And there are many of these. For example, vasopressin is affecting uh, permeability, but also is a vasoconstrictor. And so it also influences vascular tone. And so this makes it really uh, complex. So I will actually discuss nitric oxide production and vasopressin later on because these compounds are targeted as uh, 
uh, as a target for therapeutic intervention, and I will discuss these later. So clearly, sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Uh, and this uh, is both a cause and an effect of endothelial dysfunction. So mainly endothelium-mediated vasodilation and an increase in vessel permeability may occur as a consequence of sepsis and also influences the further course of sepsis patients. And now, as an intensivist, I think indeed that this is mainly bad because we know that it relates to shock and it relates to organ dysfunction. However, the effects, for example, on permeability might be good as well as bad. Uh, so the thing is that if you have a moderate infection and a local response, it is actually a beneficial thing that the capillary leakage occurs because this allows inflammatory signal molecules like cytokines, but also immune cells to leave the circulation and to enter the infected tissue. And thereby it can fight the infection in the tissue uh, and clear the infection. And it's also relevant for the repair in a later phase of the damaged tissue. So this local increase in vascular permeability is a good thing and helps recovery. However, if there's sepsis, there's a much more systemic response and then the increase in capillary leakage becomes too pronounced uh, and leads to uh, the form formation of edema that might lead to intravascular hypovolemia and shock. And therefore the consequence might be that there is tissue hypoxia and organ dysfunction and clearly this may relate to bad clinical outcomes in these patients. So there are good things and there are bad things. And that's one of the reasons uh, why it might be difficult and challenging to target these, uh, these uh, processes, because if you would inhibit this, uh, then maybe you would also inhibit uh, the good things. So what makes it so difficult to target the endothelium in COVID-19 and sepsis patients. So as I said, there are beneficial and potentially harmful effects. So if you inhibit it completely, it may not help the patients. Uh, the second thing is that the changes in endothelial uh, function are primarily initiated by pathogen associated molecular patterns, PAMs and DAMs. And so these have kinetics over time. So it's very difficult in a patient, in a given patient, to know where the stimulation of the endothelial changes are actually happening during the disease course. And then even within one patient, at a given moment, there are differences between different vascular beds and different organs, what the effects of the endothelial cell dysfunction might cause. And as I said earlier, there's close cooperation and interaction and feedback between the different players involved. And so it makes it really difficult to work on this. This is a, a, an interesting study, a small recent study uh, showing that indeed, if you measure biomarkers of endothelial dysfunction, it might be related to the outcome of, of patients with COVID-19. And as you can see here, uh, of the different biomarkers that they measured, uh, only statistical significance was reached for angiopoietin 2 and for ICAM. Uh, and still, while there is a difference between survivors and non-survivors, there's a huge overlap between the groups. Uh, and this is another way to depict this. And you can see, and again, that mostly in non-survivors, the levels are a bit higher and only significantly higher for uh, angiopoietin 2 and ICAM, uh, but this could actually be a sign that the disease severity is more pronounced in patients that will eventually die uh, and not so much uh, directly relate to the outcomes of these patients. But the overlap is huge. So on the other hand, I still think it's really relevant to look for a fingerprint. And this is a very nice study from the Mars Consortium in which they looked in normal sepsis patients with ARDS. And as you know, it was mentioned earlier, the severity or, uh, of ARDS is mainly described in the Berlin criteria by the severity of oxygenation. So the PF ratio is actually what is uh, 
making mild to moderate to severe ADS patients. But what the Amsterdam group did was look at all these inflammatory biomarkers. And as you can see, there are distinct groups. One group has elevated levels of these inflammatory markers, and they call it reactive or inflamed, while another group is uninflamed. And if you look at the outcomes of these patients, so in this case, ICU mortality, it's clear that if you are in the inflamed group, the reactive group, the mortality of mild ARDS patients is more than twice as high compared to the uninflamed group. It's even higher to the severe uninflamed group. So if you have an intervention that is aiming to inhibit this inflammatory response, it's clear that you want to select the patients that are reactive and not all these patients are reactive. So enriching the patient groups is paramount to bring the field forward, but it is difficult per patient. So can we target the endothelium in a therapeutic manner? Uh, and I will give you two examples. One is related to nitric oxide. So during sepsis, there is uh, induction of the inducible nitric oxide synthase, and there's a huge amount of nitric oxide produced. And mainly there are phasodilatory effects, and so this contributes to shock. You can inhibit this uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase with LNMMA, but it is an uh, unspecific inhibitor. So you will also inhibit, for example, endothelial derived nitric oxide synthase. And apart from the phasodilatory effects, there are many other effects of nitric oxide that of course will also be inhibited by this intervention. So this was tested in a fairly large phase two trial in almost 800 patients. And what was found unfortunately was that administration of the study drug LNMMA increased mortality. So there was a significantly higher mortality in the patients that were treated. And I've heard it said that people think that this is related to the cardiac output of these patients. So if you have a low cardiac output patient and you give this phaser constrictor, then it might actually harm the patient. But this is not true actually, as you can see here, if you look at the baseline cardiac index, also in the patients with a high cardiac index of above five, mortality is significantly higher. So this is not the case. What is of interest is that the study drug infusion rate is related to the outcome and that there is a significant survival benefit in patients that received a low infusion rate of the study drug and the mortality rate increase is observed in those that received a high infusion rate of the study drug. So as I said, what makes it difficult to target the endothelium, there are maybe beneficial and potentially harmful effects. So maybe if you have like incomplete inhibition of the nitric oxide synthase system, it might be beneficial, but if you completely block it, there might be harmful effects. Another intervention is phasopressin. And as I said, this is uh, a phasoconstrictor, but also has beneficial effects on uh, capillary permeability. Uh, and again, uh, in uh, a phase two trial using celepressin, which is a selective V1 receptor agonist, it was found that indeed blood pressure increases, but of interest also the amount of fluids needed in these patients was less. So they had a less positive fluid response, and this could be an illustration of the positive effects on capillary leakage. And so based on this small phase two trial in a couple of dozens of patients, a large phase three trial was designed uh, called Sepsis Act, and this was published in JAMA. So this trial was stopped early actually at 827 patients. Uh, and in this group of patients, it was seen that indeed, if you infuse celepressin, blood pressure goes up, you need less norepinephrine, but the positive effect on fluid balance was only observed during the first 24 hours and not in the following days. And so as a clinical endpoint, this trial was powered to show an effect related to this beneficial effect on capillary leakage. So the idea was if there's less capillary leakage, you would need shorter phasopressor infusion, so shorter duration of shock, 
uh, and also a shorter duration of mechanical ventilation because there's less pronounced pulmonary edema. And a voice out leader was no effect whatsoever on this clinical relevant endpoint. And so days alive and free of vasopressor and free of mechanical ventilation was not different between study groups. So what does this mean? I think the positive take on all this is that the endothelium is a huge organ. It's present in all blood vessels, in all organs. It's clearly dysregulated during sepsis. So there's a huge potential that there is uh, a possibility to influence this and to do good to the patients. But the more realistic take on all of this is it's really, really complex. There are multiple pathways that influence each other. There are different patients, different phases of disease. It's if even different within one patient between vascular beds. And so we do not know what the endothelial condition is in a given patient, and it's really difficult to influence this. So I think at this moment to translate the current knowledge that we have to a clinical cell, uh, setting is really difficult. And we have no techniques at this moment that we can monitor the endothelial condition at the bedside at this moment. While at the same time, we do need to know these things to have a chance to find a positive treatment possibility in these patients. We need to enrich the patients and we cannot treat everybody the same way because that is not helpful as history has shown. So I think personalized medicine is really the way forward. We have to find out in what phase of disease and what biological process is actually activated or inhibited uh, to have a better idea what kind of treatment a patient should be getting. And with that, I thank you for your information. And I hope my talk did not depress you too much because it's not close yet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thanks so much for taking us through uh, the challenges. You know, like there's a lot of evidence which comes about biomarkers which are elevated and endothelial markers which are elevated. And uh, the question is whether we should target it. Uh, thank you for taking us through the challenges with choosing the right patient, whether we choose the, you know, choosing the reactive patient versus the uninflamed, the right time of giving the therapy, of considering uh, a targeted therapy. And uh, also helping us understand that we might actually be doing harm uh, to some patients by targeting the endothelium. Uh, uh, Peter, are there any studies which are being done in uh, COVID-19 or, you know, in the labs on targeted targeted endothelial therapy in uh, COVID-19? No, so I think what we have seen in the studies that actually measure the biomarkers, uh, that uh, there is elevation of endothelial injury markers to some extent, uh, but I think we do not have any interventional study that is showing that if you target this biomarker, or an endothelial dysfunction measure that this is relating to an increase of survival or some clinical relevant outcome measure. We don't have that. I think all that we have at this moment is that we are targeting the inflammatory response. We are giving dexamethasone, we're giving uh, tocilizumab, and we are also doing that in unselected patients. And I think there are now a couple of trials actually showing post hoc trials that the treatment effects are more pronounced in patients that indeed show elevation of inflammation markers. So those patients that are hyperinflamed might benefit most. And this is makes sense, of course, but it also means that maybe patients that have low IL-6 levels, for example, as a baseline, these are not the ones that are benefiting from tocilizumab. They might actually be harmed by the treatment. So I think this is the way forward. Thanks so much, Peter. And just a word to uh, the participants who, have who are sending in a lot of questions. And uh, if you, you know, we won't be able to cover all of the, these questions in the interest of time, you could send these questions in writing to the organizer and we will forward it to the speakers who can uh, address and give a response to uh, your queries. Uh, we'll uh, move on to the next uh, session. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, our last speaker uh, is uh, Evdoxia Kirezopoulou. I hope I'm saying your name. 
name correctly, uh, from the University of Athens in Greece. Uh, Evdoxia has uh, received a PhD on biomarker guided treatment in sepsis uh, from the same university in 2020. And her main interests are immunology of sepsis, sepsis biomarkers, immunomodulation in sepsis and COVID-19. Um, so I, th I think Eva is the you know, one of the best persons to take us through this whole topic of the role of procalcitonin uh, in sepsis and COVID-19. COVID Over to you, Evdoxin. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I thank the organizers for the kind invitation to talk about procalcitonin in sepsis and COVID-19. Well, procalcitonin is uh, a, a common infection biomarker which was uh, developed and evaluated first in respiratory tract infection trials. But here we talk about sepsis. So the first uh, large trial about procalcitonin guided treatment in sepsis is the Parata, uh, where patients were randomized either to standard of care treatment or to PCT guided treatment. And that means that patients uh, received antibiotics uh, according to a start or a stop rule uh, of uh, antimicrobials uh, that had to do with uh, a cutoff of procalcitonin levels at, uh, of uh, 0.5. The main objective, objective of this trial was to show that uh, antimicrobial consumption would decrease with uh, PCT-guided treatment. And that was the case as the length of antimicrobial therapy was reduced in the PCT arm. And this was not accompanied with a higher uh, adverse event rate of relapse of infection or reinfection. Uh, um, a similar algorithm was evaluated in the largest so far trial in the Netherlands, the SUBS trial, uh, in which patients, uh, over a thousand patients in the ICU, were randomized to standard of care or PCT guided treatment. Here, there was only a discontinuation rule. So, patients in the PCT arm uh, received antimicrobials until the day that PCT uh, was decreased at least 80% of the baseline value, or there was an absolute PCT value of 0 0.5. Again, here, the length of antimicrobial treatment was reduced in the PCT arm, but the investigators came across an interesting and strange finding. Uh, of uh, a reduction in mortality after one month that was sustained after a year. Of course, there are many uh, PCT uh, randomized trials in sepsis, but the main problem of these trials is that they were uh, conducted before the implementation of the sepsis tree definition. So we can only uh, indirectly through uh, the median SOFA score values uh, su suppose that these uh, results are generalizable uh, in uh, sepsis tree populations. Uh, all, almost all of these trials uh, concluded that uh, PCT may lead to a shorter antimicrobial treatment in patients with sepsis. And when put together in the meta-analysis, it was also shown that it is not the, the treatment duration that is decreased, but also mortality. And this is, uh, uh, this is also consistent in the subpopulation of patients fulfilling the sepsis tree definition. Another problem with sepsis uh, trial, with PCT sepsis trials, is that they used different algorithms to um, evaluate uh, start or stop antibiotics. Uh, some of them had a start rule, some uh, some of them a stop rule or a mixed rule, and different cutoffs and relative changes were used. Uh, when these uh, algorithms were analyzed in the meta-analysis, it was found that only the stopping rule of antimicrobials is that uh, is fav favorable for reducing uh, mortality and antimicrobial therapy. The underlying the hypothesis for the for the underlying mechanism uh, why uh, such good results with procalcitonin guided treatment in sepsis is that through uh, the, the, the decreased antimicrobial duration with PCT uh, guidance, um, patients are suffering, are suffering from a less adverse events from antimicrobials. And also uh, there is a, a reduction in the development of drug resistance and uh, subsequent infections by immune drug resistant organisms and Clostridium difficile. This hypothesis was first tested in a Greek uh, sepsis uh, PCT trial, the PROGRESS trial, in which patients with sepsis 3 uh, were randomized either to standard of care or PCT guided treatment. The same algorithm as in SUBS trial was evaluated, only stopping algorithm, um, when uh, the PCT has fallen uh, at least 80% of the baseline value or, or was above, um, below 0.5. Uh, the patients were uh, followed up for six months clinically and also uh, by a stool sampling. Uh, 
The uh, primary endpoint of the trial was a composite endpoint of the difference in the rate of infection associated adverse events. That means that patients were evaluated uh, for any new infection by Clostridium difficile or multi drug resistant organism. Of course, among secondary outcomes uh, were the length of therapy and the length of hospitalization, mortality, and the rate of gut colonization. The trial was successful in the secondary endpoints of reducing length of antimicrobial treatment and also mortality after 28 days in patients treated with PCT-guided treatment. The trial was also successful in the primary endpoint as the uh, rate of uh, infections by Clostridium difficile and multidrug resistant organisms was reduced from 15% in the standard of care group to only 7% in the PCT uh, group in, in a time frame of six months. The patients in the PCT arm experienced less adverse events, particularly less as antibiotic associated diarrhea and acute kidney injury. And what is interesting is that the trial followed the gut colonization. The gut colonization rate was similar among the two groups. Uh, but in patients uh, in the standard of care treatment, those that were colonized had higher risk of developing a clinical, uh, clinically significant infection by Clostridium difficile or multidrug resistant organism. Uh, given that the gut colonization rate was similar, uh, it is supposed that uh, this uh, higher risk of uh, developing a clinical infection has to do with impaired gut barrier function, and this is reflected by the higher calprotecting levels in stool uh, in samples of patients in the SOC arm, but not in the PCT arm after seven days of treatment. What has changed in the COVID-19 era? Uh, we know very well that COVID-19 pneumonia resembles very much bacterial pneumonia because the patient has fever, has cough, and then takes a test and is positive. Uh, Google is a bit uh, how to um, uh, be okay at home and not go to hospital, but then they, when they are severe enough, they are admitted to hospital. And common denominator of all these circumstances is the antibiotic prescription. Uh, this is reflected in a recent meta-analysis where although bacterial and fungal infection is very uh, low uh, in COVID-19 patients, uh, the antibiotic prescription reaches 70%. Uh, data that we have for, uh, for uh, procalcitonin in COVID-19 patients uh, are not from uh, RCTs, are only from, from uh, small observational trials. I would conclude that patients at admission, uh, no, only a small pro proportion of them uh, have um, uh, elevated procalcitonin levels. This proportion ranges from 15% uh, to 35%, uh, but in, in cases of elevated uh, levels uh, at, uh, at, at hospital admission, these patients are, are at greater risk for a severe infection and need for mechanical intubation, mechanical uh, um, ventilation. Indeed, patients uh, in, in this meta-analysis elevated uh, PCT levels uh, are correlated with higher severity and mortality of these patients throughout the, uh, the COVID-19 hospitalization. When giving uh, immunomodulation such as tocilizumab and dexamethasone, uh, procalcitonin uh, remains a useful biomarker to detect a secondary bacterial infection in the ICU. Uh, and this is in contrast to uh, the sustained low levels of uh, CRP uh, after uh, treatment with uh, a combination of dexamethasone and tocilizumab. A few data about antimicrobial stewardship uh, using procalcitonin in, in patients with COVID-19. This is a, a study from the UK where patients uh, treated, uh, treated, tested positive for COVID-19 um, uh, had a measurement of procalcitonin within 48 hours of admission. And if this was low, um, physicians were uh, advised to withhold antibiotics. This, of course, was correlated with lower antimicrobial consumption. As said before, there are no RCTs uh, in procalcitonin guided treatment in COVID-19 patients. This is the only trial uh, that is registered in clinical uh, trial databases, the MultiCov trial conducted by Biomerieu and completed so far. The results are awaited. In this trial, patients with uh, severe COVID-19 admitted in the ICU are randomized either to receive standard of care treatment or a combined strategy of film array of respiratory tract secretions and PCT stopping rule of antimicrobials. 
the primary endpoint is the, the number of days free without antibiotics. And to sum up and keep uh, in time, um, I would say that in sepsis, physicians are advised uh, to follow the PCT stopping rule of antimicrobials because this reduces antimicrobial consumption and perhaps leads to better results with survival benefit, less adverse events of patients, and uh, less development of multidrug resistance. In COVID-19, uh, a PCT elevati elevation uh, at the uh, hospital admission is a signal of unfavorable outcome. In cases that PCT is low at admission, uh, perhaps physicians should withhold antibiotics. By clinical suspicion, of course, they start antibiotics, but then they have to rethink about the stopping algorithm. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you for taking us through. Uh, I think a commonly, I would say, misused biomarker uh, in uh, in hospitals, you know, procalcitonin is sometimes used, but what you, you know, to diagnose, whereas on the other, you know, we know that it's, it's a good stopping rule uh, kind of a biomarker, uh, more than actually differentiating, uh, even though it was initially initiated in 1993 as a differentiating marker between bacterial and viral sepsis. Um, so um, thank you so much for taking us through that session on procalcitonin with a lot on your research as well. Uh, there, uh, I think probably maybe in the interest of time, there they weren't any questions which I actually put in the chat box. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Eva, for your talk and, uh, and for uh, taking us through uh, this, uh, this concept, this topic of procalcitonin in sepsis and COVID-19 and when we should actually use it uh, in the ICU. Um, so once again, I would like to thank all our speakers uh, for their time and such a great discussion. There are several comments in the chat box on how wonderful and excellent each of these sessions have been. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there were several questions which could not be addressed. Um, and we would invite all the participants to please send in your questions to uh, the organizer. The email is given in the chat box and we will forward it to the speakers for uh, getting the responses. Uh, so all the talks that were, that happened today have been recorded and will be available as a podcast on the website after the Congress. Please visit the website and sign the World Sepsis Declaration. And once again, I would like to thank uh, our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific. And I would also like to thank uh, the Global Sepsis Alliance team for giving me this honor of moderating this session. Uh, have a good day.